we're really here because there's a, there's a really big connection that The Simpsons has to DragCon. RuPaul is going to appear on a, on a uh, an episode that's coming up. Yeah, when yes. does it actually come? It's November 18th is the tentative date, but that, it, it might change, but it'll be in November. In November, RuPaul will be uh, on The Simpsons. So that is some really, really important stuff. But mostly I got to talk about me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I have a very emotional attachment to The Simpsons, especially to Lisa. When I was uh, 12 or 13, I was first introduced to The Simpsons, and it was a phenomenon. It was the 80s. And I first learned about The Simpsons on uh, the Tracy Ullman show. Um, you know, it was a time when creativity was really, really at its peak. And there was something that was kind of warbly and weird and funny, kind of a Keith Haring kind of drawing that came to life with a, with a giant dose of humor. And that's what I remember most and what attracted me to it. So for me, this is really important for me to sit up here with these absolute geniuses and... Um, Legends. Yardley, I really want to hear um, Lisa's voice just because it'll make me feel nice. I want you to say something really kind of kind to me. Raja, <laughs> this is Lisa Simpson. It is such an honor to be on the same stage with you. <laughs> I just want you to know I can now check something big off my bucket list. Oh my God, I'm going <laughs> to <f> <laughs> die. <laughs> oh my God, that was amazing. Thank you so much. So we really want to talk about the concept and why you invited RuPaul, why it was like an open invitation, why it was time to have the conversation to bring Ru in this. Like, well, how did this all happen? I want so to know. the episode is about uh, Marge starts to sell Tupperware. I'll say that correctly so we don't get sued. And she's not very good at it because she's too shy. And Julio, who we will later learn, is actually has an alter ego, Penelope Cruising. But Julio... <laughs> Uh, gives her a makeover, and she feels so fierce and, and confident and has a few martinis. She sells tons of Tupperware, and she's like, oh, I'm good at it now. And then she doesn't realize that everyone thinks that she's a drag queen. <laughs> and so in order to continue, she has to, like, sort of Victor Victoria it and pretend to be a drag queen. Her hair is uh, already as big as, <laughs> probably bigger than most drag queens. I actually, I can't wait to see this. I yeah. I, it's going to be really, really exciting. But Tress, I want to ask you a question. Yes. It's like, I know you are like, you've got multiple voices. You not only just do one character, yeah. but you are definitely a chameleon and someone who, um, who multitasks in mm -hmm. this process. Mm -hmm. um, did you get to play a role in the RuPaul episode? And what did you I do? I did, but about I'm it. trying to think. I'm racking my brain to, well, you, about what because which the one B it might story be. is that it's a, it's an Amelie parody. If you know the movie Amelie, uh -huh. and it's a Lisa discovers a box, and it's sort of in the same way where she makes somebody feel good, and so she basically starts doing the opposite of pranks, where she sneakily does things to people and makes them happy. And Lunch Lady Doris is. Uh, yeah, so lunch lady's in there. You, you got it. You got to eat. Am I right? Uh, Agnes. Agnes is in there. Agnes Skinner's in most things. <laughs> because there's got to be an adult in the room. Am I right? <laughs> Nobody on that cartoon is in charge. Oh, wait, and Brandine is in there. Brand, oh. When she tries to sell uh, oh, Tupperware. Brandine is going to sell some Tupperware. To Cletus. And to Cletus, her own, her own <laughs> husband and her co and cousin. <laughs> but uh, yeah, everyone, every home can use a little Tupperware. You just have to keep track of it. That's one way of losing some friends. I'll tell yeah. you that. Marge keeps when she's selling it. She keeps. Sorry, what were you? Oh, I want I want Tress to do the crazy cat lady. Oh, yes. One of my all time sure favorites. She could use a makeup. The crazy cat right? lady is our funnest one to write for because it's just it's just letting Tress loose. So usually, like we'll go, uh, it'll the, the script will go crazy cat lady noise midterm elections. Crazy cat lady noise. So I. No, she be a crazy cat. She's just trying to be like Nixon. I got a little fluffy. I look good doing it, the voice too. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Yardley, um, I'm going to leave the floor open to you because I want you to describe, okay, first of all, I like fangirl on Lisa because for me, emotionally, I'm really connected to her because she, she's uh, creative, she's, uh, she's kind, she's sensitive, she's passionate, she's a little bit angsty. 
She's you just a tell me like, yeah. like when you do Lisa, do you like lose your mind every time? Do you like I do. I, I have this funny relationship with Lisa Simpson where I feel like she's actually, she exists quite separately from me on her own. She's so fully fleshed out. She's so multifaceted that I feel like I really, when I see her lines on a page, I see her little face. Mm -hmm. But I really feel like when, when people, people are attached to Lisa Simpson, they're not attached to me. And I am 33 and a third percent of that entire process. Mm -hmm. It starts with the writing, which grounds it, and then you move to the actors, and then the animators. So I couldn't possibly take full credit for who she is, but I love her like all of you love her. She's such a special, exceptional little mm -hmm. being. And I, um, I always say that Lisa Simpson is who I, who I wish I were. <laughs> and she's certainly who I wish I'd been at eight and who I wish I was at 53. Wow. So. <laughs> That's amazing. But she's such when a... When you get uh, there. Uh, <laughs> thanks, love. Mm -hmm. um, before we open it up to the floor, I just want to ask you, did you realize as people who participated in this entire process for now decades, did you realize when you first started that it was going to be as huge and as iconic as it is now? Well, I didn't, I didn't start till 10 years in, but you, what... One of the funny stories about The Simpsons is that it was, it was greenlit by Barry Diller, who was running the very brand new Fox network back in... The, back in 80, 80, 88. 88. 88. And, um, I remember that time. I'm that old. So. I, <laughs> likewise. I had a job, so... <laughs> um, and the story is, and I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, but the story is, is that he was leaving the network to go off and do other things, and the Tracy Ullman show got canceled, and the Simpsons moved into half-hour episodes. And because Jim Brooks, James L. Brooks is who he is, he's, he's a, you know, he's, every, he's that guy, he said, I'll only do the Simpsons if we get no studio or network notes. And Barry Diller said, sure, no problem, whatever you want. And the rumor is, and we were a mid-season replacement in January of 1990, is that everybody thought, it's no f***ing problem because the show isn't going to go anywhere anyway. We're just going to do 13 episodes and then it'll be off the air, so who really cares? That's and why then, I did of course, season three of RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> <laughs> you thought this can't possibly have a life, like, right? Who, nobody will see this little old thing. Yeah. No, and then it hit so, so big, and it was this phenomenon, and then the story continues where everybody at Fox was like, we knew it all along. We knew it was going to be a hit. So we always say now at 30 years that we're halfway through. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> I don't know. Sam yeah. Simon, um, I, I'm just talking to the writers that were there at the beginning, that was what he was saying at the beginning was um, in the writer's room was that it's 13 and out, so let's just have the best time ever. And 13 episodes, not years. Yeah, 13 episodes. Yeah. And so let's just make the best, most, the 13 episodes that will most speak to us and be fun for us. And I think that was what really you know, made it so good. I remember wearing The Simpsons merchandise as a young teen, and um, recently I went to Universal Studios, and it's still going strong. Like, what, 30 years later? Yes, we're in season 30. 30 years later. <laughs> it's memorable, and everyone is still buying the merch and loving it. I'm going to go ahead and open this up now because I have nothing more to say, and I just want to hear what everyone else has to say at this point. I'm going to open this up to the audience. So if you have any questions for any of these three geniuses, please, by all means, stand up and say your name. And Do you need a microphone, or can you yell? Oh, yeah! Hey! Over there. <laughs> uh, my name's Ross. Uh, I really appreciate The Simpsons. I've been. A re I, I remember when it was on Tracy Allman too. And, uh, do you all do a, a table read, and then do you record together, or do you record your voices separately, or kind of what's the what's the process of rehearsal to performance? We do it like a radio play. There is a table read uh, a ahead of time. We get the script. Uh, the brilliant script, I, I, I never uh, understand why anyone thinks that they have to change it, but uh, we read through the script in this big, beautiful room with lots of people sitting around and uh, have a jolly good time. It's very free and loose. Then we go away, the actors go away, and the writers do a rewrite. And then we, on Mondays, all uh, get together 
and record it like a radio play. For the most part, we're all there uh, as the years go by, fewer and fewer people show up. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they, they phone it in or they, re they record separately. You know, like Hank is on the East Coast and people are, you know, h here and there. It, it takes about, what, three hours to record? Four. Three, four hours to record. You know, great lunch. Yeah. And then about nine months later, it might be ready. Wow. Yeah. It's, right. I mean, it's close to a year. Yeah, you know, the before. animators animate to the... Uh, to the voices. Film Roman is in a whole different uh, area. They're in Burbank, and we, we, it's a great place to go visit. If you ever get the chance, they they have mirrors, and they they'll like be flipping these things, and they make these expressions, and they uh, copy them, and it's it's really interesting. It takes about they record them on the other side of a mirror. No, they they have the the actors' voices in their heads, and they have a mirror for their own faces, right, so that right. they're like. Like they, they know Homer's mad, so they will be yeah. looking at or they'll like use their own face. They, there are model sheets that sort of say, yeah. this mm -hmm. is how Homer looks mad, this is how Homer walks. There, there's, there's certain things they follow, but a lot of times when they're doing something we haven't done before, they'll have to use themselves as a mirror right. and they animate too. But the you have to do the voices first do. because it's, you know, that way you're really free and you can add all of the things that. Uh, you you know that your character does after years and years of doing the the character little quirks that you add to the, your lines and kind of make it yours a little bit not too much because don't want to insult the writers and besides there's really not much you can add to your lines to make it any better because they're so so beautifully written they animate it to our voice tracks and it's it's not like uh, in uh, what was it. Uh, Mrs. Dow, what was it? Uh, the one where Robin Williams, he's doing, uh, well, he, he's he doing the voice to the animated cartoon. Yeah. It's Which not done that way. They do do at the end when we get to a point where we have a, a color. We do fixes to picture. Yeah. And way they're very good at it. So in other words, what they're saying is when Monique was having her lip sync for her life with Vixen, <laughs> sometimes in the editing, they don't always show when the girl is actually lip syncing and when she's not. And they might accentuate the time when she goes into the splits and the shablam. Mm -hmm. And some girls don't always get it. Uh, Did you get that? Uh, editing. Right? It's Translation. <laughs> you over there in the aisle. You there. Beanie, yes. There you go, yes. Who's the funniest person each of you has worked with besides the Simpsons? Besides the oh, Simpsons? Who's like been ever, on the show? Ever, ever, ever in life. Ooh. You know, I was really impressed with, were you there when Sasha Baron Cohen came in? No. Ooh. He was so good. He came in. He was supposed to play an Israeli tour guide. And he had like three different Israeli accents. I think he lived in Israel for a while and he can speak Israeli. Like he's just such a funny person. And he would like yell at his daughter in, in a different language. And we're just laughing. We don't even know what he's saying. We, and we put it in. And then later somebody told us that what he was saying was really dirty. And, and then, but uh, he, was, he was funny and very prepared. And uh, I'm, it's hot. It was very hot. He was, he's also very handsome. In yeah, his, funny in his people place. are really hot, especially if they're really like hot anyway. So. Yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> Wait, I need to give you uh, here. This is if you have any more Simpsons questions, you have a Simpsons eight ball. Where is oh the guy? Oh my god! Presents. Where's my? <laughs> Your eyeliner is on fleek. Okay. <laughs> All right. People stay, still say on fleek. Here you Good. go. Here's up. Oh my oh, god! Oh, where's my fucking right. toy? Oh, I will give you some toys. <laughs> Gotcha. You're have, like, a okay, okay, okay. Toilet. Let's go uh, over there, uh, Orange Hair. For both of you, your legacy really is your voice. And I'm wondering uh, like, what that experience is like, because like, especially for you, Ms. Smith, you've influenced people for 30 years through the role of Lisa Simpson, but walking down anywhere in Hollywood, people, like, of course, your face is recognizable, but yeah, your I real legacy that. is uh, not connected with your face. And I wonder what that experience is like. I actually, I decided when I was about seven that I wanted to be an actor and that I, that I was, I had a plan for world domination. And um, voiceover was not a part of it at all, in any way, shape, or form. And, and I sort of, in retrospect, think perhaps it was because I was teased so mercilessly for having such an interesting voice. But now I like to say, who has the last laugh now? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, 
you know, it's it's evolved. It's a, it's a long and compli- not uh, perhaps not even that interesting an answer, but it, it has taken a really long time when you get to, to be known for something that you never intended to do. Um, although I enjoyed it, I think for a long time I sort of discounted it, you know? And because I had a very specific plan of what my success would look like, and then it didn't, that isn't what it's of course ended up looking like, which isn't to say that I'm not successful, but I attached so much meaning to that original picture that I missed a lot along the way. And so the lesson is attached to the process, but not to the results, I would say. And it is really only in the last probably 10 years that I have come to, and it wasn't that I didn't appreciate Lisa Simpson, but again, I was, I was grasping for something that I couldn't achieve, and because I couldn't get it, so much else didn't count. And that was the tragedy. But I love Lisa Simpson, I truly do, and even if I didn't voice her, she'd be one of my favorite characters of all time. Lies. And I'm... <laughs> And I really am enormously proud to be a part of her. And so, you know, I think labels are kind of bullshit anyway. So when somebody says voice actor Yardley Smith as opposed to actor Yardley Smith, I'm like, whatever, who f-ing cares? I, <laughs> you know? I, so that's how I feel. I think, I think that is one of the greatest parallels about this entire convention is, is I think that people here are coming for an answer or are already living that truth where you're just like, f*** it, we're just here to have a good time, we're here to just let go and find joy in everything. Um, Let's open it up to one more question. So I'm doing my best to raise two gifted daughters of my own. It being Mother's Day, I'm trying to figure out what's Marge's secret to raising two gifted little girls and a special little boy. (laughs) <laughs> I'm going to let you guys answer this one. You know, the, the interesting thing about, I was, it has something to do with Lisa, too. Like we always talk, or Lee and I, that because um, she's very protective of Lisa, and, and sometimes she gets sad because Lisa often has sad endings. And uh, at one point, I remember her saying, why, is, why does it never she work out She always has a sad ending. She always has a sad ending. You guys, every time you ending. give her something, you take it away. Yeah. It's so brutal. And I, I, I it really made me think about it for a long time. And then I realized, even though most of the writers are men, they're all intellectual guys. Like, they're all, they're all kind of the nerdy guys and sort of the smarty pants that nobody understood. And I think that a lot of that is them working that out, that like they know what it feels like to be the one person who knows how the lights work and everybody's like, oh, you know, and then nobody's listening to them. And, and so that's they're, they're working out that frustration. I'm not sure if I have any advice. Don't they kind of say <laughs> that Lisa is the voice of the writers? I've always, I've always heard that, that, that Lisa Simpson really is. She's their therapy. Yeah. But I guess, you know, to your question, Lindsay, I would say... Uh, in addition to that, in the n- early 90s, George Bush, George H.W. Bush famously came out and said, we need more families like the Waltons and less like the Simpsons, which completely missed the point because as sort of sassy and bratty as Bart can be, the one thing that the Simpsons always have that separates us from, say, Family Guy or um, American Dad is enormous heart. And they all really deeply care about each other. And whether or not they show that every single time in every minute of the day, I think is would be untrue, would be, you know, not um, akin to reality. But at the end of the day, you know, they throw themselves in front of a train for each other. So I think it's that if you lead with kindness and compassion and um, Curiosity. Curiosity, I think, is one of the most important things to being a really interesting and interested person. And if you have that, yeah, I'm sure you'll raise beautiful girls. I, I, I'm running out of merch, but you can have these. There's two things for both of your daughters. And then. Oh my gosh, Mom, where left. did you save anything for me? I'm, I'm going to get you a special oh, box. So You're gonna I, a I have a quick question, and I want I each of you to answer just really briefly, or if you have any more information for us. I just want to know do you know anything about the conspiracy theories that the Simpsons <laughs> are far ahead of us in the future? <laughs> <laughs> and predicted that uh, uh, some weird guy, some weird orange guy, was going to come down yeah, an escalator right. and so on. Do you want? You're the writer. 
right, world. But, so you go ahead and answer that first. Well, there there were two predictions. Next, one was an actual yeah. prediction. One right, it was really was just um, when Lisa was in the future and she becomes president, she talks about that she inherited a lot of problems from President Trump. But that was just us trying to think, like, what would be the dumbest thing America <laughs> could do? What would be the worst that we would go and that so she'd have to really turn the bus around? There is, There was animation of... Uh, Trump going down an escalator, and it was exactly like, you know, when he hired all those actors to announce his candidacy. That was not a prediction. That was fast animation. That was, that was like it actually had happened. And then we, we, animated, at, we animated that afterwards. Oh, and then, okay. so that was, that was, it, that looked really impressive. Like, oh my God, oh, they even, yeah. but uh, yeah. But there's a whole 9-11 one. Mm -hmm. That one is just freaky to us. Yeah. There's like the when Homer goes to uh, New York, and there's he goes in the Twin Towers, and there's like there's like a 9/11 behind him in the sign. There's, it's all that's all. I don't know what happened there. That yeah, was maybe sometimes art predicts things before we even realize it. Like artists, that's our jobs to kind of do that gig, and kind of you know, yeah, forecast what's it, whatever happens. Yeah, to some kind of yeah, I believe it thing is thing out there. Yeah. Let's do a couple more questions. I'm gonna do this I'm side, nice. the, the, the boy with the beard, and then the girl, the one next to her, the them next to her. <laughs> I'm, I'm worried about pronouns in this environment, so you first, <laughs> you with the beard. Just with the longevity of the show and kind of how the cultural conversation has shifted over those years, what does that look like sort of as you point it out the season or you know, year over year, how, how is the cultural conversation impacting what goes into the show? I think it's one? ripped from the headlines, isn't it, Carolyn? Uh, a lot of times, yeah. I mean, it's funny because we have this thing now where we pitch our stories to Jim Brooks and we, and, and people come with little things and they're like, they'll go, you know, you will say, that's a real thing, you know, where people actually do this now. Or, you know, like there was one where Homer was selling advertising on his head and <laughs> like, no, here, we have like the pictures of things that uh, happen. I, I remember I had an opening for an episode where Homer got stuck in a in like this coil in a playground. And it was from a, some viral photo. And I was like, oh, this little little fat kid got stuck in the, the, it was like this coil that was a ladder. And I was like, oh, it's so brilliant. We got to do this. And then uh, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, which is one of my favorite shows. Like they came out like a month before because they don't have to animate. And we're like, oh, oh we have to do it. Because it at that point, it was too late to change. But, uh, but we were like, OK. We both saw the same viral photo. <laughs> <laughs> and you. Hi, my name's Becca. Uh, I'm grew up in Springfield, Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. Uh, 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 so my question is basically, The Simpsons has so many very special moments throughout its history. What are some moments that really stuck with you or that you're really proud of to be involved with on the Simpsons? I actually have a funny story about in season two where Lisa Simpson gets a crush on her substitute teacher, Mr. Bergstrom, right? Played by Dustin Hoffman. It's one of my favorite episodes of all time. And at the end of that episode, as he's Did leaving... Did you get to act together in that? Yes. They flew me to New York to spend a day with him. It's really one of the highlights of my career. It was, it was incredible. And when, when she cries, I was bawling my eyes out. And, and I'm not a good, like, I'm not a, okay, Yardley cry. I'm not that actor. I really, but I really feel her, right? So, but at the end of that episode, they, Mr. Bergstrom writes her a note and it says, this is everything you need to know. And it says, you are Lisa Simpson. And I remember reading that note in the script and going, what the f*** does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> like, that's it? That's all you're going to give her? Oh, my God. And I'm not even kidding. It took at least a decade for me to go, oh, that, oh, oh. So, you know, I'm slow, though. I'm slow. <laughs> we just did a, just... a recent episode for, <laughs> that I... Um, it was the Halloween of Horror. It was the first time we did an episode that wasn't a Treehouse of Horror. It was Halloween. And it's a very moving moment at the top of the thing where Lisa gives up her lifelong toy to sort of save. And we had been over it and edited it. And, and, and then I, we went in the orchestra. That Alf Clausen was scoring the show. And it was... The, the scoring was so beautiful. And then watching it, somehow that moment with the strings... Everybody was crying. It was really weird. Like we'd all seen it so many times, but everybody in the room was like, <gasps> "One more question." question. Um, let's go back to this side. You standing up. You have a question. You do. Do you feel that 
during your career, was it easier, was it harder, or, or was it like an easy progression to be like accepted as female entertainers during your tenure? Mm. I'm going to let you answer this. I don't know what you you're know, talking about. I, I did want to say this because this this one thing is is, is exactly what the episode is about. Is, is uh, As a female artist, and I think Anais Nin wrote that uh, it's hard for an artist, a female artist, to fight for equal rights. She has to create them. And I, I think that's sort of true. Um, but I also feel like Women are sort of told traditionally that being feminine means to be demure and quiet and compliant. And then at the same time, I see like really woke dads these days saying, I'm not going to let my daughter play with Barbies and, and no princess stuff Aww. in the house. And uh, I, I feel like that's what I love about drag is that it's like it is super feminine, but yet you feel like the most powerful Thing is to be a woman, and it's 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 really a good inspiration for uh, for me. I, growing up, that's part of why this episode came from me. Was I grew up in Hawaii, and I was there was it's a very gender fluid place, and uh, I think that having drag queen friends when I was a teenager affected the way what I thought of being feminine. I did think of like there is a certain point where it's like, bitch, get up and you know be yourself, look good, and um, do it. Just do the work. And, and I, I think that was, for me, a, a big help. Would you like to add to that? I, I can't possibly top that. <laughs> that really, that's, that's pretty f good. Um, there's a statistic that is something like for, for every uh, eight parts in a film that are male, there's one woman. And you see it on screen. I mean, I had certainly advantage, at least I was a white woman. That was already some advantage. If you're, if the disadvantage is that you're a woman, if you could be a white woman, you're a little bit better, uh, had a little easier time. But to Carolyn's point about being demure and being pe people pleasing, I was certainly raised that way. In my office, I have a, I have a development company with a business partner, and we, we develop everything. So it's partly what the podcast came out of. We just. Which is great. We just go. It is great. It's it's called Small Town Dicks, and you really all should download it's really, it. It's really, really good. If you like true crime, say it out loud. Small Town Dicks. Okay. It's not about dicks. <laughs> it's about detectives, and all of our stories are told by the detectives who actually oh, cool. broke the case. Trust do you participate in this too? Or you no, no, no. Oh, okay. This is real. Oh, okay. This. Is I mean, I do it's, crime. It's a thing. But uh, on my own time. But I was just going to say, in our <laughs> in our office, we have um, a needless apology jar, and every time it's usually me who needlessly apologizes uh -huh. for something, <laughs> I have to put a quarter in the jar. That jar is pretty. Full, so uh, but Carolyn said it so beautifully, I don't really have anything to add to that. I really had, uh, uh, as for me, I because I uh, started with voiceover and have uh, done nothing but voiceover, I'm happy to report. Um, I'm relieved of that on camera pressure, and um, I can look like this. Um, Gorgeous. Uh, Stop yeah, it. Oh, come on. I wasn't <laughs> fishing, I swear I, to I God. I don't mean to interrupt your thought, but uh, my mind immediately goes to Cassandra Peterson. Do, do people... Well, like, she and I are, are great friends. Good friends, you know? I would imagine. We, we were in the Growlings together. Gotcha. I dressed next, next to her. And I love her, Seen and naked. I get the same vibes, and you kind of just give me the same well, vibes. Well, our, our comedy is probably very similar. Oh, uh, dirty. We, well, yes, very body, very body. Uh, yeah, she and I were in the Groundlings together for many years, so I do have a, an improv uh, comedy background. And from that, um, and just uh, being from a large family, lots of, uh, lots of brothers, I've got five brothers, I've always played male and female characters. Oh, yeah, she has And that's a lot really of male helped characters. me in my voice career because when they hire you for a cartoon, they want to flesh out that contract. So if you can do three voices they get you up for th they get you for up to three voices in a regular cartoon not the simpsons wow. that's prime time but um uh, and i do 20 on those but um so you want to be able to flesh out a contract so they will call you up because you solve a lot of problems for them so you play the little boy you play the old lady and you play the you know piano playing chicken yeah. you know i've played spore mold you know a toaster you know, and you know various flowers and vegetables, but uh, yeah, I'm on veggie. I'm on veggie tails. So um, it has aided me to 
uh, play both sides of the fence and uh, have avoided any kind of uh, a, a sexism, if you want to call it that. Um, so you were sort career. of like, you were doing gender neutral and vegetable neutral. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. For yes. longer than anyone else has. Yeah, yeah, but you know, yeah. that's, that's, uh, that's one of the funnest things about what we get to do is that yeah. as artists, we get to explore those ideas, you as a writer, and you both as actors and writers and all the amazing things that you all do. But I wanted to say a special thank you to Yardley today, the voice of Lisa, and to Tress, and to this lovely, oh my God, these women here have been my magic all day. Um, will you say some final words to uh, the Simpsons fans today as writer, will you? Sure. Um, well, thank you all so much. We uh, really appreciate, uh, we appreciate oh. people who love our show. We. Um, we love it too, and uh, thank you so much for being interested and for watching. And thank uh, you. you need a I want my merch. Yes. Thank you so much for coming, you guys. And um, it's just a, been a real pleasure and a privilege to get to see you all. Yes. You hardly anything? Thank you all so much. It means so. It means everything to us because without you, we don't have a show. Um, and from Lisa Simpson, I feel like, you know, she doesn't have any friends on the show, but you all are her friends, and she's so grateful. Thank you. <laughs> Happy Mother's Thank Day. So much. Happy Mother's Day to any mothers out there. Drag mothers. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs>